We are in the Advent season. I've been thinking about that the past couple of weeks. For those of you that didn't grow up in church, people like me, or for those of you who grew up in churches that didn't observe Advent, you're unfamiliar with Advent, I want to help you understand the importance of the four Sundays before Christmas. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus. It means coming or arrival. It's interesting because the Latin translation of the scriptures happened in the fourth century. It's called the Latin Vulgate. And in the Latin Vulgate, those who translated scripture from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, they used the word Adventus, the Latin word Adventus, to describe the Lord's coming. Both the baby who was born in the major and also Jesus' second coming, the word Adventus. So during the month, we celebrate the coming of the Savior into our world, and at the same time, we are waiting for his arrival. We celebrate Jesus' coming while we are waiting for his arrival, his second coming. We're celebrating, and yet we're waiting. Those are the two things I want us to talk about this morning. If you look at Isaiah 9, let's read together verses 1 through 7, a very familiar passage of scripture, especially at this time of year. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. I want you to underline that phrase in your Bible because we're going to come back to it. By the way of the sea along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, (coughs) will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is one of those scriptures that we take out of the attic when we are gathering our Christmas decorations at this time of year. We unbox Isaiah 9 and We wrap it in tinsel and lights, and then we hang it over the manger and turn on some Nat King coal just for the ambiance while we pour ourselves a cup of wassail and get all sentimental and everything. You know, don't get me wrong. It is a beautiful passage, a powerful passage, an incredible promise of a change of events, the coming of the one who would be known as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You see, the problem is not with the passage or the promise. The problem is that we fail to understand the context of the times in which these words were spoken and the waiting that had to take place before the promise came to fruition. The golden years of Israel happened during the 40-year reign of King David. When David died, his son Solomon took over. And Solomon, although the Bible says Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, he was not the leader that his dad was. So Solomon's interests were divided, we might say. And so was the kingdom once Solomon died in 931 B.C. When Solomon died, what was the United Nation of Israel split in two? with Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The prophet Isaiah stepped onto the scene when a man named Uzziah was king of the southern kingdom 
of Judah. Uzziah was, um, his reign was marked by peace, but don't let that fool you, because times were troubled. The people's hearts had wandered far from God. Their lives had become a mess. And then the, only, the situation only worsened during the reigns of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. Internally, the people were a mess. They had forgotten God and grown weak. Judah and King Ahaz weren't as strong as their neighbors. They weren't as strong as their brothers to the north from the kingdom of Israel. They were under threat from Syria and from their brothers to the north. Ahaz was shaking in his boots, wondering what day it was that his brothers to the north and the Syrians would come in and attack him. And that's when God sent the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 7. And this is the message that God told Isaiah to deliver to King Ahaz. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Remaliah. God told King Ahaz, chill out. I know you're afraid, but what they've planned is never going to happen. So just relax. So what does King Ahaz do? Well, he runs to the superpower of the region, the king of Assyria, and he throws himself at his feet and pleads for him to come in and to rescue him from his neighbors. You can read about it in 2 Kings chapter 16 in verses 7 and 8. Listen to this. Ahaz sent messengers to say to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and of the king of Israel who are attacking me. And Ahaz, listen to this, pay special attention to this. And Ahaz took the silver and the gold found where? In the Lord's house and in the treasuries of the royal palace, and he sent all of that as a gift to the king of Assyria. Did you hear what he did? He went into the temple of the Lord, and he cleaned out the treasury, and he sent it to this pagan king for protection. Now, you already know this isn't going to work out well. You just know, and it didn't. It was a time of unrest, of upheaval and turmoil and great anxiety as the people worried about what their future would ho was hold. Ahaz wouldn't trust in God. God gave him a clear word, but Ahaz was trembling. He would not trust in God. He would not wait on God. And as a result, things only grew worse and worse and worse. The northern kingdom of Israel, you know what's interesting? Ahaz sent all that money to the king of Assyria, and you know what happened? The king of Assyria gladly took all of that gold and all of that silver, and then the king of Assyria turned on Ahaz. The northern kingdom fell in 721. After Ahaz died, there came a new king to Judah. And in 586, the, north, the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, fell. Jerusalem and all of Judah. You see, Ahaz was anxious. He was frenzied. The future looked bleak. The problems were piling up. He was looking for a quick fix, a simple solution, and he refused to wait on God. My friend, i got to tell you, when we refuse to wait on God, and we come up with our own solutions. We only create more problems for ourselves. Do you know that? Stop to think about the examples that we've been given in the Bible. I mean, why did a servant named Hagar give birth to a little boy named Ishmael? Wasn't it because Abraham and Sarah refused to wait on God? I mean, God told them, he made it clear, I'm going to give you a son. And God reiterated that over and over again. But the years rocked on and there was no baby. And so Abraham and Sarah came up with their own plan 
and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And we are still dealing with the consequences of Abraham and Sarah's unwillingness to wait on God today. Now, how about another one? Moses is up on Mount Sinai meeting with God. There's fire on the mountain. There's smoke on the mountain. And the people of God are down in the foothills below fashioning a golden calf to worship. Why? Because they didn't want to wait on God. Because they refused to wait on God. We don't like to wait either, do we? I mean, the truth of the matter is, we are, we, we are no more prone to wait than Abraham and Sarah, the people in the foothills of Mount Sinai, or Ahaz. If anything, we are more impatient today than any generation that has ever gone before us. I read an article by Chris Mother, who writes for the Boston Globe. He wrote this article called, Instant Gratification is Making Us Perpetually Impatient. Say that four times as fast as you can. It will tie your tongue in a knot. In the article, he details how our impatience has led to the development of, of many new discoveries of ways to speed up the process of getting what we want. But even though we are getting everything that we want faster now, it is still not fast enough. He writes, the demand for instant results is seeping into every corner of our lives, and not just virtually. Retailers are jumping into same-day delivery services. Smartphone apps eliminate the wait for a cab, a date, or a table at a hot restaurant. Movies and TV shows begin streaming in seconds. But experts caution us that instant gratification comes at a price. It is making us less patient. So the question has to be asked, how in a sped up society can we avoid the pitfall of the pool of now and learn to patiently wait on God? How can we avoid the pitfall of the pool of now and learn to patiently wait on God? Uh, that's a great question. I believe there's even greater insight in God's Word for you and me. So let's go back to Isaiah 9 for a moment. Now that you know what was taking place when these words were spoken in history, let's read verses 1 and 2 again. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles, those of you that went with me to Israel a year ago, Galilee of the Gentiles is the area around the Sea of Galilee. That You remember being in that area? We spent three days there. By the way of the sea along the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. I want to give you a point of reference so that you can better understand this promise. When he says, in the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. The land of Naphtali and Zebulun were west of the Sea of Galilee. It's that land right there around the sea. And what's interesting about that is when the Assyrians came in, I told you about that, to topple the northern kingdom, this is exactly the route that they took through the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. The people were deported and their land, Zebulun and Naphtali, became Assyrian provinces. When the Assyrians came in, they killed many people, they deported many more, took them back to Assyria. God's people were devastated. They were humbled. In Isaiah 9, Isaiah speaks as though all of this were behind them, when in fact, it was still yet to come. It was still yet to come. He writes, there'll be no more gloom for those who were in darkness, even though they were in the midst of gloom right then. In verse 2, he proclaimed, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. When it's as dark as night, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You see, I need to point out to you, because it's easy to read over these passages and really miss the meat of what's there. Isaiah writes as if these things have already taken place. 
that the light has already dawned. I um, I've fallen in love with a guy named Dr. Alec Motier. I, I saw some of you look up real quick. Uh, he's a Bible teacher. Since we've been going through the book of James, I've been reading his commentary on James. And, and this past week, I was reading his commentary on Isaiah. And this guy, man, God has really gifted him to be able to, to, to pull out from the Hebrew and the Greek wonderful insights. I stumbled on this jewel. Let me read it to you. You got to pay close attention. I don't know if it was because it was 8.30 in the morning, but the folks in the early service, I read this to them, and they just kind of looked at me like, oh, man. So at least play along with me. He writes, the hope is sure. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 is couched in past tenses. The future is written as if some, something that has already happened in time. For it belonged to the prophetic consciousness of men like Isaiah to cast themselves forward in time and then to look back on the mighty acts of God, saying to us, look forward to it. It's certain he's already done it. He's already done it. And because of this confidence, Isaiah can place the light of Isaiah 9.1 in immediate proximity to the darkness of Isaiah 8, verse 22. Not because it will immediately happen, but because it is immediately evident to the eye of faith. Those walking in darkness can see the light of it. Those walking in darkness can see the light of hand, and they are sustained by it. That gives me goosebumps. I know some of y'all get misty at movies. I, 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 I'm misty eyed. And maybe you will be too after we unpack this a little bit. You see, the circumstances of God's people didn't change for many, many years. For many years. The problems persisted. As a matter of fact, they only got worse. Yet one day, one day, the one Isaiah said would be known as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He was born. He was born. He wasn't ushered into the world with pomp and circumstance. There was no Macy's Christmas Day parade. No, no, no. He was born into a world of strife and turmoil and upheaval. The old powers of Assyria and Babylon why they were long gone, but a new power had come up on the, the scene, even more powerful, a, po a power that was more ruthless, wielded the sword over the very land where Isaiah prophesied these words 700 years earlier. He was born in the midst of upheaval and anxiety and strife. There were little boys, brand new boys, being born who were immediately killed because the evil king wanted to eliminate him. Surrounded by uncertainty, feeling like they had been lashed to the mast of a never-ending storm, still there were those who believed. There were those who had never given up hope because God's promises never fail. Oh, the Messiah may not have come yet, but we believe we are not throwing in the towel on the promises of God. Luke tells us about an event that happened at the birth of Jesus. When he was just eight days old, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple to be circumcised. On the eighth day, like all Jewish mamas and daddies, took their little boys on the eighth day for that rite. When we read in Luke chapter 2, it's not the circumcision of Jesus that captured Luke's attention. It's what happened as Jesus and Mary and Joseph came to the temple. Read along with me beginning in verse 25. At that time, in that moment, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout, and he was, look at this, eagerly waiting. He was eagerly waiting. 
for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah that day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Simeon was righteous. He was a devout man. But this is the description I love. And he was eagerly waiting to see the Messiah. And for Simeon and all of those who had heard Jesus' message, those who believed that he was the promised one, it was worth the wait. Oh man, had they waited. For so long they had waited. The days, the years, the decades, the centuries they had waited. Generations had come, generations had passed away, and still no sign of the Messiah. But still they believed. Still they believed. They knew one day he would come, and so they were willing to wait. Jesus grew up, he began to minister, and he began to proclaim the good news. He quoted Isaiah in his very first sermon. And then Matthew tells us in Matthew 4, look there with me if you will, in verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went out and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake, which is really the Sea of Galilee. In the area, look at that, of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, from that moment on, Jesus began to preach, turn around. Don't keep walking the way you've been walking. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. There are those names again. Zebulun, Naphtali, the people who had been humbled the way that the Assyrians had made their way through, those who had walked in darkness for so, so long, those who had died and been deported, generations who had come and gone. God said the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and now the light had come to Zebulun and Naphtali, just as God had promised. I got to show you something really amazing. Go back to Isaiah 9, verse 1. Remember that phrase I told you to underline? Galilee of the Gentiles, or in Hebrew, literally, it's Galilee of the nation, of the nation. Look there at verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. That phrase, the Galilee of the Gentiles, there is no other place, not one single place in all of the Hebrew Bible where you find this phrase. Galilee of the Gentiles, of the nations, for those walking in darkness, not just the Jewish people, but all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, a glorious light has come to rescue us. Us. Not from some world power, not from the Assyrians, not from the Babylonians, not from the North Koreans, or whoever it is that is threatening us as Americans. No, 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 the light has come to rescue me, you and me, from a far, far greater power. He has come to rescue us from the power of sin and death. Do you believe that? I sure hope you do. Because it is in seeing Jesus 
in believing Jesus, in trusting Jesus, and knowing his promises in the darkest times of your life. Understanding that he has saved you from more than your circumstances. He saved you from more than your circumstances. He has saved you from your sin and the power of your sin, which is death. My friend, that is the greatest gift in the history of the world. You know, I've been seeing commercials on TV, and, and some of those commercials, I have literally seen automobiles wrapped with a bow on top. I'm not getting my hopes up. Some of you may walk out on Christmas morning, and there'll be a new ride in the driveway, all wrapped up, big bow on top. You know what? If you get that Christmas morning, I got news for you. That gift cannot touch the gift that Jesus gave and he steps into your place to forgive you of your sin and to conquer death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sin? Jesus took your pain to sin upon himself. The Prince of Peace has come to save us from our sin, to restore us to a right relationship with God. We celebrate his coming each and every Christmas. We should celebrate his coming each and every day. But at the same time, we are waiting. We're celebrating his arrival, and yet we are waiting. Like Simeon, before he held the newborn Prince of Peace in his arms, we are waiting. While we go through the trials of this life, we are waiting. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And so we wait, Lord Jesus, we wait. Many of us in this sanctuary are enduring very difficult days right now. And I want to encourage you to wait. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't turn your back on God. Wait. Wait. Just as Simeon waited. Just as he eagerly waited. You know, just this past week, I visited with some of my friends. And I've encouraged them to wait. I want you to know, I don't study these scriptures so I can teach you. I study these scriptures so God can teach me. This past week, I had lunch with a friend. He had just left the funeral of his niece. She was 20 years old, beautiful, had all the world in front of her, bright as she could be, when she had a seizure driving down I-35, and her car drove off of the highway and ended up in a car and pushed her down. Mm. I listened to him, and the family was overwhelmed with grief. And I encourage him to wait, to wait on the Lord. And I say, come, Lord Jesus. Come. I talked on the phone with a friend whose marriage is a mess. I listened to him. I tried to console him and comfort him. And I encouraged him to fight like crazy for his marriage and to wait, to wait upon God. And I say, come, Lord Jesus. Wednesday night, right before I taught Bible study, I was with a lady in my office who's never been to Britain Christian Church in her life, but a friend of a friend of a friend said, you ought to go visit with this guy. And she came. Two years ago at this time, her husband took his own life. To make matters even worse, her son found his own dad. And it's been two years. And she's waiting for things to get better for something to change. And I encourage you, don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And I say, come Lord Jesus. I could go on. That's just this week. I could go on sharing stories of my friends. Matter of fact, I don't have to rely on my friends. I can share some of my own stories of how I'm waiting. And you could too. You have your own. We're waiting. 
Watch him. We're looking for Jesus to come to change our circumstance. We know his promises. We know that he's never failed to even keep one. So we wait and we won't stop waiting. We won't turn away. We won't give up hope. We will wait in eager expectation just like Simeon. John tells us the day's coming. In Revelation 21, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look! God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. All these things and so we wait. And so we wait. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, Kim, her sister, her grandbaby came, little four-year-old with a brain tumor, and we prayed for her. That little four-year-old baby has gone home to be with the Lord. And her mom him, all of the family, they wait. They wait. With you, they wait. My friend, I got news for you. We are not the first who've waited on God. We come from a long line of waiting. People that have found themselves in the crucible at the crossroads like Ahaz. And God says, be still and know that I'm God. Wait on me. Don't be like Ahaz and run off and come up with your own plan. No, no, no. I want to give you some scriptures. Write these down. And you know what? Some of you may, you may be on the calm seas of life right now. You just can't believe how good life is. I want to encourage you to write these verses down because your storm is coming. Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. I love this because sometimes when we're going through the storms of life, we can lose confidence in God. But the psalmist says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, verse 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And last of all, the prophet Micah, in Micah 7, verse 7, he says, As for me, come on now, read it with me. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God. My Savior, my God, will hear me. My friends, I got news for you. It's going to be worth the wait. It's going to be worth the wait. The Lord in his grace, everybody listen to me. Those of you that are going through the trials of life right now, the Lord in his grace, he may very well change your circumstances in the near future. He can do that. He's done it before. He can do that. And at the same time, he very well may not. And he can do that. You trust me. Hey, don't, don't buy into the lie that if you send $10 to that preacher or you find this person over here and they pray for you, that's a lie from the pit. I smell smoke. You wait on God. You trust him. You cling to him. And I got news for you as we leave here this morning. If you are not a follower of Jesus, nothing I have said makes any sense to you whatsoever. 
This is inside information I'm sharing this morning. If you don't know Jesus, my friend, this morning, come forward and give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart. You see, the Bible teaches you are not born a Christian. The Bible teaches you and I are born sinners. And it's only when we recognize I have a need, and that need is for Jesus. That's my greatest need. And we surrender our heart to him, and we say, Lord, I confess. I'm a sinner in need of your grace and mercy. Lord, would you come into my heart and be my Savior? That is when you become a follower of Jesus, or what people call Christians. This morning, if you've never done that, I want to invite you to come forward. Give me your hand as you give Jesus your heart and begin to walk with him, to learn of his way. As we stand and sing the song of invitation, won't you come?